Um, we started with a segmented, um, four piece segmented uh, plate last session and wanted to turn that into a basket illusion. I took the liberty, as I mentioned, um, it came out in the email of doing a portion of the inking ahead of time so that the demonstration goes quicker. I'm not crazy about watching people make little points on uh, in ink for long periods of time. So if you watch a little bit of it, you'll get the idea without needing to do um, the entire piece. I decided, um, I guess it was in January, that I wanted to try a basket illusion piece. And I wanted to try it based on an actual basket, a real um, Native American basket. I didn't want it to, and I wanted to start with, um, at the source with a real basket. I didn't want to go to a, a, a YouTube video and watch somebody make a basket who learned how to do it by watching somebody else who watched a video, who watched a demonstrator who had actually never seen a basket. I wanted to go back to a real basket and say, okay, can I make something that looks like a real basket? And um, that led me down a rabbit hole. So I'll give you just a quick, um, a quick tour of my, um, of my uh, journey. I started, if I can get the first slide up, just to show you what I was, what I um, kind of was aiming for. The first slide shows a photograph of an actual uh, Native American basket. That's a Pima basket that was made in um, Arizona, approximately 1930 by undoubtedly a woman, nearly all of the early the baskets at that time were made by women. And below it is this piece, which is uh, my attempt at duplicating or making an illusion of that piece as closely as I could. You see that it's not exact. Some of that has to do with um, the detail, how much detail I could get in the drawing. Some of it has to do with just some liberties I took with the design. My goal was to base the turning on an actual traditional basket. When I started looking at baskets to reproduce um, an illusion using, I discovered that almost all the baskets I found were made by a few tribes in the um, Southwest, the, the desert Southwest, uh, typically the Pima, the Hopi, the Navajo, and the Apache. Those four tribes seem to be making most of the baskets. Certainly most of the really decorative, high quality baskets that were coming onto the market in places where I was, was seeing them in galleries, places where I was seeing them in auction sites. I was wondering why that was, so I bought a couple of books on Indian basketry and discovered that that wasn't a coincidence. The baskets that were made throughout the Americas peaked in about 700 AD, starting almost 5,000 years ago. And by 700 AD, the basket tradition started to decline as, as pottery increased. The, the technology of pottery was discovered and developed and the Native Americans discovered that the, potter, the, the uh, pottery had advantages over the baskets. It uh, was varmint proof. It didn't leak because they could use baskets that were with rosin on the inside for water. They were more durable. So baskets began to decline um, in the uh, uh, around 700. And by the time the Europeans arrived, they kind of drove the nail in the coffin of the baskets because they brought better ceramic uh, traditions. They brought metal implements and they bought, brought with them European basket traditions. So even where baskets were still made, for example, in the Northeast, typically the baskets borrowed on the European tradition. So by the time these baskets were made, the baskets that were being made in the Northeast were indistinguishable from European baskets. The Shaker baskets and the Native American baskets were the same basket, they were indistinguishable. Most of the baskets that were made were utility baskets. They're called burden baskets. 
early in history. The Native Americans used them for um, carrying things, sifting grain, wherever they needed to uh, you know, transport material, baskets were the uh, object of choice. They also made ceremonial baskets. The ceremonial baskets were used for weddings, for coming of age ceremonies, for um, dances where they were asking for rainfall or for successful hunting, which was a different, a different um, construction method than the burden baskets. So the Southwest Native Americans were some of the latest tribes to be strongly influenced by the Europeans. And they were still making traditional baskets in the early 1800s when the Santa Fe Trail went in and the Santa Fe Trail brought settlers, it brought tourists, it brought contact and trade goods with the Europeans. And then later on the railroads in the 1860s brought more of the same. So the Native Americans began having more contact with the Europeans in the late 1800s. These were the Southwest uh, Native Americans. Earlier, all of, most of the other, or almost all of the other Native, Native Americans had contact much earlier. That contact coincided with a interest, great interest in the United States on all things Indian, all things Western. That was the time of the, um, the Wild West shows, for example, and the novels about the Wild West. There was a great interest in the Wild West. And the baskets became objects that could be collected as souvenirs. They were sold in trading posts. They were objects that were taken to the East um, as souvenirs, if you will, but then later in galleries and museums of the Native American handicraft and then the Native American art. The baskets became a very important trade item for these tribes. And by the 19, around 1900, they were the most important trade item for, for some of the tribes. That's how they made their livelihood, making baskets. The price of the baskets in trade was influenced by the quality of the basket. The, as the galleries, and the museums began, and collectors began demanding higher quality baskets. They paid a premium for those baskets. The Native Americans being shrewd business people upped the ante and increased the quality of the baskets to get the higher price. And that fed on itself and improved the quality of the baskets in the Southwest from the period of around 1900 up until the 1930s, 1940s. So that, that was driving this basket, um, trade, if you will. And it's the reason that when I started looking for baskets that I wanted to use as a basis for my turnings, I was finding mostly baskets that were made by a couple of tribes. These are, these are all Pima baskets, except for one, which is a, um, a Navajo basket design. And most of them followed traditional patterns. The, the history in the basket making community was to use traditional patterns and to stick with the traditional patterns. So most of the baskets have very similar patterns and most of those patterns are patterns that go back historically for a long period of time. So the artists making the baskets sometimes made minor variations, but most of the basket patterns you see, you see repeated um, over and over again. That differed from pottery, where in pottery, the artists tend to be much more creative and they take, took the art in a different direction. So you, so you see advances in the design and new artistic things being tried in pottery. And typically that didn't happen in, bas in the baskets. The baskets tended to stay very traditional. What was interesting is that the early baskets, the burden baskets were made by a technique that was woven. They had a, a, a warp and a, um, they had radial pieces that came out and they had 
pieces that were woven in and out around them, much like a child's you see in a, in a Easter basket, for example, they were woven in techniques that were called either um, plating or twining, but there were woven techniques. The baskets that were that became most popular for trade were based on the ceremonial baskets. The ceremonial baskets were more decorative. And in order to get the fine quality that the, the collectors uh, demanded and the, the quality, the fineness being the, the texture of the basket being very fine, the design being very fine, the detail being very intricate, they had to use a coiling technique because the woven technique doesn't lend itself very well to intricate designs. These intricate designs, I'll show you in a minute how they're done, are done using a coiling technique. So the, the demand for baskets that had intricate designs led to the baskets being made with a coiling technique. So what I needed to do in order to try to duplicate these baskets was to duplicate the coiling technique. So if you can go to slide number two, that's a close-up of um, a coiled basket. It's made using a foundation piece that runs this way. And that foundation piece is either made of bundles of grasses or made of bundles of twigs this particular basket, it's a cat, they're, they're bundles of cattails. They are wrapped with these pieces. Okay. And those pieces are willow and they're made by the basket maker holding a willow stick in their teeth and then peeling down little strips of the willow off of the branches. Those are called um, splints, and then they are dyed to get the uh, design in the basket. So that's the construction. These pieces are wrapped, and then each piece is sewn into the previous coil, and that's done by poking it all and all through it, and then threading the piece through. So it's a sewing technique, not a, weaving, not a woven technique. It's much like a braided rug. But notice that the basket has no radial elements. Those radial elements are elements in a woven basket. And all of the, or almost all of the decorative Southwest baskets are coiled, not woven. So there's no radial, there's no radial line in the basket. So to get to there, the first thing I needed to do was create a pattern. And the way I decided to do it was to use an app called GridMaker. And I, I use an iPad tablet. I think it's also available on other uh, formats. But if you can go to the next slide, this is, this is what the GridMaker looks like just if you bring it up just to see what the app looks like. It's called GridMaker and it makes graph paper and it makes all different types of graph paper. The graph paper I used is a polar coordinate graph paper. So if you go to the next slide, you can see all of the different graph papers that are available and the polar graph paper is the graph paper that I used. The individual graph papers, the first few were free, at the rest of them cost 99 cents forever. So it's a 99 cent investment to get some polar graph paper. Go to the next slide. So this, this is when you ask the app to generate a graph paper, this is the menu. The menu will come up and you can tell it how many divisions you want. The divisions being the radial lines out and I told it because I'm going to be using an eighth of an inch beading tool and it does make it to scale, I specified an eighth of an inch step. That produced all of these, all of these um, concentric rings. 
was how that was produced. So at that point, I had concentric rings. You go to the next slide, I hope. Yes. And then you can specify the major um, radial axes. And I specified that I wanted 60 divisions. So there's 60 radial lines going out. And I wanted an inner radius with no lines of one inch. So that's how that was produced. Once you get there, this is done with a, a CAD type of file. It's a vector file. And the next step is to color it. When you color it, it translates this file into a uh, photo type of file that is not reversible. So at this point, you can change anything you want. You can change your any of your axes. Your, you can make more detailed, more detailed types of um, graphs. You can make more or fewer radial lines. You, everything at this point can be changed. Once you hit that paint up there, number three, that converts that into a photograph. And at that point, you can no longer go back and change it. So you've got to get it right at this point or else you have to start all over. So we'll go to the next one. Okay, this is an example of the painting. All you have to do, this is the same graph paper. You can pick the brush over here. You pick the color family you want. In this case, I wanted this family that goes from um, orange up to browns. These are all different intensities of the same color. So you pick the color you want. This Actually, this is the red. This, this is the one that I use for the brown. And this little one here is your eraser. So to color it, all you have to do is touch a pixel and it changes that entire pixel to that color. You don't have to try to color it in. So if you go to the next slide, I'll show you zooming in. One more, there we go. You just zoom in and you, you'll get a piece of it really big and you can just very quickly go along and, and just keep touching the dots and coloring your picture. So that's the way that I made the design. Once you get the design made, make two copies. One copy is you're gonna use, or I'm going to use for drawing the design. And the other one I'm going to use to transfer the design on the shop made jig that I used. So once we get it made, I need to transfer it. I'm gonna transfer it onto a piece of plastic or anything which is rigid and you, can use um, repositional adhesive because I use the same piece of plastic for all different bowls. I wanna be able to get the thing all off. I want, the, I want the paper to stick, but I wanna be able to remove it. And I use plastic for that. This happens to be a cake, a cake platter used from Hobby Lobby where people who make cakes stack up the layers on the cakes. That's what, that's what this thing is. But any piece of rigid plastic would work. I drilled a hole in the middle cut this out, glued it on, and I ended up with this, this piece, which is a piece of the jig. So I slide this piece onto the headstock. It just fits right over the spindle. And I use a couple of magnets to hook a steel rule onto the top of the lathe. And then the steel rule points to the line that I want to draw. And I just use a couple of these little clamps to hold it still. When I, I put one on either side and that just locks it in place. It doesn't have to be held real firmly because I'm not, I'm not using any tools. All I'm gonna do is draw. Then once I get it on there, the, the bowl gets mounted in the chuck, which we did last time. And then I use this on the bed of the lathe to just swing around and draw. And as I advance it, I just keep 
drawing using using the bottom of this on the bed of the lathe to reference a piece. I can pass that around if you want to see what it looks like. There's nothing, and I guess and this, there's nothing um, nothing fancy. It's just a really simple shop made jig. Make it in a couple of minutes, but it lets you get it lets you lay out these lines. The lines don't have to be perfect. You'll find, at least I find that when I do this, I get a little bit of variation. If I measure them, I'll find there's a little difference, but that's a good thing because these are handmade baskets. You don't want to have absolute perfection because like I said before, it looks like it's machined. You want something that looks like it's a handmade basket. You don't want to look like it come off of a machine tool. So the kids, that gives you just enough error built into it to keep it looking, to keep it looking realistic. So what we end up with is we end up with the pattern transferred onto the piece. It started out white and we ended up with a pattern transferred on in pencil. Once we get the pattern on, my next problem was to how to color it. I had no idea when I started out what I was going to use to um, color the piece. I looked at what other people were using on some of the YouTubes, people who are making um, baskets, the illusion baskets. And I also did research on what types of inks were available. And I discovered that really, as far as I can tell, there is only one readily available India ink that works well for this because there are three requirements. One requirement is it has to be, the ink has to be opaque enough with enough pigment so that it'll work on wood. A lot of uh, inks, for example, this is an example of water of watercolor, but many of the inks don't have enough pigment and you don't get good bright colors on wood. So you need a, a ink that has good bright color. It has to have a lot of pigment. You need an ink which is going to be light fast, something which five years down the road is not going to fade away. Almost all of the pens that you see in the art store, art and craft stores, any type of flare type pen, any type of coloring type of pen are not color fast. In a year under sunlight or in a room, they will fade. So you need something which is color fast. And you want something, I wanted something which was waterproof. So when I put the finish on it, I don't have to worry about the finish running. So you need a product that's waterproof, color fast, and a lot of pigment. The pen that I found that met that, and the, actually the only one I found that met that was a, a German made pen, Faber Castell. And I'll pass one around just so you can see what they, what they look like if you're interested in using them. No, nope, wrong one. There we go. So that brand, that German brand of pen, that's actually a pen used by um, artists. It's, a, it's an actual artist pen as opposed to a, a craft pen as opposed to a child's pen. That's used by serious artists, professional artists, and it's an India ink. It's actually colored pigmented India ink. It's, the pens are not refillable. The pens are available on Amazon among other places, I could not find them locally. I looked at a couple of places locally for them. I found them on Amazon, but they're generally most affordable in boxes. You can buy um, packages that come in different, I guess, I guess they're for different intents. For example, you can get pen, a box that's made for people who are doing cartoons. You can buy uh, a box. This one is a box made for people doing landscape. This one is a landscape and this one is a Terra earth tones again. So you can get pens that come in sets of colors that mat, that are relate to each other in a good way. So where an artist might use this group of pens. So these two 
sets of pens, the landscape and the terra gave me all the colors that I've needed to do the, the baskets, which are various shades of yellows and browns and greens. They're around ten dollars for six pens, somewhere in that neighborhood. I think you bought some recently. Is that uh, the, the landscape off of Amazon? Purple yeah. Lisa is nine dollars. Hobby Lobby sells this pen. Um, they're discontinuing them. And right now, you they have a very limited selection of colors. I can only find them in black. Actually, I, mean, I don't know. Have okay. 20, 30 different colors. Okay. Okay. The pens also come in different tip sizes. So you can buy a box of four pens with different tip sizes. And I, and I find that two of the tip sizes were useful. I use the fine tip to, you'll see later, to do the, the imitation of the stitching. And I use the B, which stands for brush, to do most of the inking. The brush pen looks like a felt tip marker but it acts like a brush. If you, do a, if you touch it very lightly, you'll get a very, very, very thin line. And if you push down, you'll get a wide line. So an artist can use that, the pressure on that pen to go from thin to fine to thin to fine. And it works as a brush because it's wider, works pretty well on the, the basket illusion. So I did almost all of the inking on the, pat, on the background, on the pattern with a with a brush pen. Just in passing, I found one other item, which you might, this is almost an aside, but it might be of interest. Um, Wins Winsor and Newton, which is another art company used by artists, packages, makes watercolors for watercolor artists. And they also make pens that contain the same professional watercolor ink. The advantage of the watercolor ink over other watercolors is again that it's light fast. It's archival, they guarantee it won't fade for a hundred years. The disadvantage, number one, is it does the pigment is much, much lighter, it's not as intense, and it's not waterproof. But it allows you to blend. So if you want to blend two colors together or run two colors together, it is much easier to do it with a watercolor than it is with these pens. These pens don't like to run together. They don't like to blend very well because they're waterproof. Now I'll show you, I did blend them and I'll show you how I do it, but it's not nearly as easy as it is with the watercolor. I did, I used this, I, I brought this just because I wanted to show that I used the watercolor on the outside rim that we're going to burn today. And I did it because it's lighter in pigment and it makes it easier to see where I'm burning. But it also could be used as a stain if you were interested in various colors of kind of a wash, a stain wash for other types of woodworking. So it's a product that may have some interest because it gives you almost a color wash that is um, an archival an archival product still, and I wanted to do this one. So this red on this piece is actually the watercolor. So this is a, this is the red from the watercolor box, sure. So what I'm going to do next, I wanna talk for a little bit about the background and then we're gonna ink the background. The background on the, on the pieces is a natural willow color, yellowish green on the baskets that I've been trying to do an illusion of. And I found that I can get the color by using a yellow, a cadmium yellow and a green, yellow green pen for the shadows. So I use this, I put this on first and then do the shadows in the, in the yellow green and it emphasizes the shadows on the coils. So I found, find that that um, worked well and I used that for almost all of the baskets. But then I tried, all these baskets are a little different. I've been experimenting, trying different things, which works best for me. What do I like? What do I don't like? 
So I tried something different, and that's another thing you might want to consider. If you, if you use just the ink and use a flat finish, this happens to have deft on it, which is a lacquer, you get something which to me looks very much like a basket. So I'm very happy with that flat look, but I tried a different look on this basket initially. The first thing I did was I, I tried it, instead of poplar, I tried it on maple. So this is maple. And then instead of inking the background where this is ink, this background is simply orange shellac. I just shellac the background. So there's no ink on the back of this piece. And that gives you a pretty realistic look actually, and saves a whole lot of inking. And then I decided to try it again on poplar. And this is the same thing done on poplar with just shellac and not ink. So that's a different, that's a different look. I myself prefer a more natural flat look, but the reason I did this was because my wife, who was my client for these, said she liked the shiny look. So it's personal, it's personal preference. This, the shellac on this piece gives it more of a gloss, more of a sheen than the flat deft does the satin. This is actually a satin deft, um, this piece. Again, same, same idea. This is, this is deft and this is shellac. This is inked. This is natural wood. <laughs> I didn't have any spray amber or orange shellac. So I had, so I brushed on one coat of orange shellac to get it the color. And then I sprayed on two more coats of uh, clear shellac with a spray can, just because that's what I had available. First of all, notice, I wanna show you that there's a, re there's a method to the madness here. Um, this piece has been partially finished. This is obviously completely natural wood. When I do the background down here, I found that I, what I want to do, when, we're gonna do the pattern first, but when I do the background, I want to put the cadmium yellow on top, and I want to put the yellow green in the in the valleys to emphasize the valleys. When I do that, I don't want a sharp line. I want them to blend together. And this these inks won't blend if you do them dry. They'll only blend if you do it if you wet it. So what I do is I, I'm going to wet this when I get done, and then put the second color on the piece wet. And that'll cause the ink to um, run together and give me an, a smooth transition without giving me a hard line. It'll also, I found, raise the grain on the poplar. And to me, that raised grain look on the poplar gives you a much more natural look. It looks like a splint on a basket because it's not a perfectly smooth finish. So, you know, once again, if you, if you machine this perfectly and you get perfect edges, you, um, you're gonna end up with something which doesn't look like a basket. It's gonna look like it come off of a machine tool. And raising the grain, I think helps to, with the texture of the piece. So it gave me a double benefit. It ran the ink together and it helped to give me the texture. So what I'm gonna do on the brown, is first of all, let me, let me say that it's very easy to mess this up, um, make mistakes in the pattern. And, and this, there is a mistake in this pattern, which I'll let you find. I'm not going to, I'm not going to point it out, but it's a pretty glaring mistake. Um, it's easy to make mistakes. So what I, what I started doing was to kind of do all everything kind of one color for the whole piece. And then um, 
go back and do the other colors. And I found that invariably I messed it up. So what I do is I just do the, the pattern as I go along and not try to get productive because it's just too easy to lose count of how many, how many of these um, beads you're going down to. This, this pattern has three beads and then two beads across and three beads down and two beads across. And your eyes kind of, my eyes kind of go crazy and I lose track of which bead I'm on and then I end up making mistakes. So the first thing, the first thing I'm going to do is this bead. Can you, am I at a place where, can you see? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I've got to bring this piece over and I'm going to do it just to find my pattern over to here. And then I've got to bring the pattern back over to here. So now I'm down my two. I'm going to give myself a pencil line so I can see a little bit better. Now I'm going to have to go down three. Now I've got to come back with my two. Now I've got to come down three over here. I screwed it up yet? Three. Two. Over. Screwed it up. Well, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> you see how easy it is to mess it up? In front of the whole group. I did, but I'm not going to try to erase that much. I'll, I'll, I'll try to erase a little bit, but this is going to be a, a new pattern. You see, I should I I came across, went down. I should have gone down here, and I didn't use the. I'm going to talk in a minute. I'm going to talk about the stitching, but I'm going to use black for the stitching, and I'm going to. Um, Give myself my edges. Now what I'm gonna do is use the brush. This, this next color I'm gonna use is a dark sepia. And I'm gonna use the dark sepia to um, fill in the valleys between the beads. You can't go really fast with these brushes because it takes a little while for the ink to soak down into the brush part. I missed the lines. Sorry. Does, do the pens last a while or does the wood draw it out pretty quickly? Uh, I have never had a pen run out of ink. I wear the tips out first. The, the tips are really made for paper and the roughness of the wood. Um, after, after I've done, um, oh, I guess about five bowls, my, my uh, green yellow pen was shot. It just it just wore the tip out. It's just the tip gets kind of flat and ugly. Gary, for the brush style pens, take a paper towel and pull out the nib, and there's a fresh brush on the inside. Oh, really? So just turn it around and stick it back in. You get another another fresh nib on the inside. Oh, great! I didn't know that. Learn something.
I'm going to go back now and this one's not dark enough. At this point, I just kind of go back and forth and I don't want it to look uniform. Again, this is dyed fiber, you know, willow fiber. The dye that the Native Americans use started out being natural dyes. And by about 1860, the Native Americans discovered that, again, this is when the market picked up, that the aniline, the dye, commercial dyes um, that they could then use allowed them to make more baskets. They could spend more time making baskets and less time manufacturing dye. And they began using commercial dyes. So a lot of the, a lot of the baskets are made with commercial dyes. And then the galleries began paying a bigger premium for natural dyes is the so there was kind of a, a retro go back, if you will, from the commercial dyes to the handmade or the, the natural dyes based on, again, driven by the market. And some of the Native Americans were using and still are using commercial dyes. Some of them are using um, natural dyes that, that they make. Um, it's, they, charge a premium for the natural dye because it takes a lot longer to do. It's much more expensive for them to make the baskets. So well, that's a strange looking pattern we got in that one. Wow. Okay. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is the yellow. I'm going to lay down the, the cadmium yellow is a highlight. This is going to be the highlight, the, the, the light part of the pattern. Maybe uh, one thing I'll, I'll, while I'm doing this, I'll mention that I'm going to talk in a couple of minutes about trying to get this, the look of the stitching. And what you're seeing, obviously, the corn of the cob look is the look of trying to imitate that look of the stitching. And it, I find that for me, it's a, it's a decision about how, how much liberty do I wanna take, how much artistic liberty do I wanna take in emphasizing that stitching. In the original baskets, there isn't much of an emphasis. It's kind of hard to see. And yet it really adds a lot to the, to the appearance of the piece to have the more vivid stitching. So I've tried all different combinations from no stitching to really exaggerating the stitching. And they all work differently. It's, it kind of becomes, um, I guess, personal choice. I got a little more brown to do there. I think I'll just leave this center and just finish up the, finish up the yellow. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna wet that. The reason I, they did this in two up. Once I wet this up here, it's not going to dry fast enough for me to put in the stitching. So um, I didn't, I didn't do this whole thing at once because I didn't want to have this part wet and then have the stitching run when I do the stitching. So I'm going to get up my little handy dandy pen uh, brush and I'm just going to wet this and cause the yellow to run. When I put the darker on it, it'll all bleed together. It's not light, not light fast. It's not light fast. They'll fade. Okay, now we go with the green yellow. And now when I put the green yellow in, because I've got this is wet, it will, um, it'll initially go in looking like a, almost like a line, but in a few minutes, it'll, those colors will run together and you'll, it'll 
look like a single color, but it'll be, the top will be lighter, like a highlight and the middle will be darker like a shadow. And you won't be able to know that I'm using two different colors here. There'll just be a variation in tone. One problem, one of the several problems I have um, I've discovered when I do the segmented pieces is, is that my center, um, not on this piece, but on the segmented pieces where it's a solid piece takes the ink differently. That's one thing that uh, to be aware of. I've caused that to blend down there a little bit more. Okay, that's got to dry. What I'm going to do next is put in the, the stitching. And I want to talk a little bit about stitching. I've tried, I guess, five different ways of trying to do that illusion of the stitching. And it varies from very, very, well, varies from really this one. This piece is called Man in a Maze. It's one of the most common designs and it shows up not only in baskets, but it shows up in a lot of Native American uh, memorabilia, if you will. People use it now on t-shirts, they use it on um, a lot of different things, but it's called Man in a Maze. It's a, traditional, it's a traditional pattern that was actually originally taken, I believe, off of a rock carving. This piece, I decided not to do any stitching at all. So this piece simply is colored without any of the little lines. So this is the, this is the minimal amount of stitching, which is none. So that's no stitching. The next thing I tried was I tried to use a burner, a uh, wood burning pen, and I just poked, I took a skew end, which is just shaped like a little sharp triangle. And I just poked the skew in the, into the valleys all the way around. So all you see is little black dots, which are intended to um, show the shadows where the threads come together. Yeah, by poking in the, by poking in the, the burner, I was trying to simply show these shadow points. Each one of these windings go underneath into the foundation. So I was trying just to show that shadow point. So that was, that was what I tried to do on this piece. Taking, and that's also the same thing um, that I did on this piece. The next thing that I tried was to not use the wood burner, but to use ink. And what I did on this piece, which I think is, gives a pretty realistic basket look, although it's, it's very subtle. You can kind of see there's something going on without really seeing what, how it happened. And what I did on this piece was that I inked the background in the yellow, the chromium yellow, and then I wet it. And then I applied the yellow green to the wet chromium yellow and the inks ran together, but still left the texture. So you get a texture without really being able to see, almost see how that inking was accomplished. And it was done by blending the inks, letting the inks run together. So that's, that's the next level up from being pretty, um, pretty minimalistic on the, on the uh, stitching. The next stitching was much more aggressive in look. And this one, one thing I tried was to use the tip on the burner that is manufactured for uh, basket illusions. They actually make a curved tip, which goes over the, a beading and burns all the way around the beading. 
I'm sorry? Fish scale. Okay, a fish scale. The problem I had on the segmented um, piece, and this was a 16 segmented piece, is that the segmented bowl is, the seams are tight enough so that after I have um, done the background, I can't see the seams. You can't tell where the seams are. But if you hit the seam with that fish tail, that fish scale burner, it burns it darker. And what you end up with is you end up highlighting the seams. So I started it with the fish scale burner and decided it was not working because it high, whenever I hit a seam, it, the burner just burned into the seam and I ended up with black marks and I couldn't, um, I didn't like the looks, the look of it. So I finished it instead of, um, using the burner, I finished it with ink. So this one is partially burned and partially inked. And quite honestly, if I didn't tell you that, you probably wouldn't know it by looking at it. The inking and the burning um, really are pretty similar. On this one, I'm going to use ink. And the reason that I, um, the pop, this is the popcorn one, the sweet corn. And I decided to, try the kind of the extreme look and really bring out the stitching. Again, it's kind of a, a choice. And I thought I would do that for the demo because it's easier to, it's easier to see on the demo um, exactly what it is that I'm doing. So I'm going to just, uh, I, I've tried, um, when I first tried this, I wasn't sure that I would be accurate enough by hand um, to, to make a uniform pattern. I tried measuring it, and first of all, um, it just takes way too long. And secondly, it almost makes it look too, too uniform. I found that just doing it by hand gave me a better illusion of a real basket, and went a whole lot, um, went a whole lot quicker. So these are all done um, by hand, without any measurement. But what it's what's what's important is to remember that these stitches should all be on average uniform, which means that you shouldn't have them all lining up. And what you have to be careful when you're doing it is you don't start lining up the stitches or else you'll end up with something which looks like, a, which looks like diagonal patterns, which isn't the way that the pieces are made. And in this, in this piece, this, I'm exaggerating the stitching, which gives it an interesting effect. Um, maybe you may like it, you may not. I'm not sure if I like it. It's kind of sweet cornish, but it's a, certainly an interesting look. And the first thing I'm going to do is, um, it'll be a little bit probably harder to see, but I'm going to um, ink the the brown, and I'm going to use a black ink, and it's very straightforward. Fortunately for you, I don't have very much of this to do, so I won't bore you for very long. These basket illusion pieces that are done this way, do try your patience. I'm gonna finish this one and then I'll do the yellow. You'll be able to see what I'm doing better. And there isn't really much to learn from watching me draw little black lines on this piece. Notice though that I'm doing it by eye and I'm trying to make, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep each piece going radially. So I'm thinking about where the center is and trying to make each line aim toward the center. That's my, that's my goal as I, um, as I do these. Enough of that. I'm going to do the, the, the brown, which isn't brown, it's dark sepia. All of the colors in these um, India ink pens are, are colors that are artist, I guess, definition or artist colors that aren't traditional lay colors, at least in my experience. You know, they're dark umbers and raw umbers and things like that. Um, 
the thing that is um, probably hardest is when you take a, it's very easy, I find, when I, you know, in, in one session to keep my marks relatively uniform, adequately uniform so that they look pretty good. What I have trouble with is if I put it down and then finish it tomorrow, trying to get the same uniform, um, uniformity in the marks, what I'll find is I'll have, um, you know, all of the ones I do today look pretty similar. And then all the ones I do tomorrow will look pretty similar. But unfortunately, the ones I do today and the ones I do tomorrow will look all look uniform, look different. They'll just be slightly closer or slightly farther apart. What I try to do when I'm doing this is to not look at the row above so that, I, so that I don't unconsciously start lining up the marks or else you end up with a pattern. I also find that I, it works best to turn the piece and not try to turn your hand. So your hand is always oriented. Basically my arm, I don't pick my arm up off the table. I try to rotate the piece around get a more uniform mark that way. Okay, that's enough. So that's uh, one section there. I've also have to, I'll have to finish up this section and this section. These down here are wet, so I can't do those now. The last thing that I have to do on this piece is to burn in the, the rim. I found that on all of the pieces, I found that the wood burning looks better on the rim rather than ink because you get you can see the you can see the texture from the wood burning on the rim where you don't get the texture from the ink so i do burn the rims and it's the one area where um i find it works to my advantage to mark where i'm going to burn with the pencil um, because if I, if I mess it up, I can erase it. And once I, once I burn it, the game's over. I have a burner, which is, um, I like for doing this type of thing. It seems to give me a, enough heat and it, it was inexpensive. I got a lot of tips, which, um, which is good, but I found that I tried to do some more serious pyrography with it where I had to do shading and I found that the inexpensive burner um, doesn't maintain temperature as well. And I found that I got variations in temperature, which if you're trying to do real fine work caused me problems. But for this, um, for this type of work, this burner, which is under $50 um, works pretty well, heats up quickly. I got a scrap piece here I'm going to Make sure I'm I've got a good temperature. I seem to have a good temperature. I'm going to try to I'm going to try to work this flat so you can see what I'm doing. I usually um, I usually actually tip them and hold it in my lap, but you'll never see what I'm doing if I do that. I'm going to do this in three steps. I'm going to go along and get the top done. Then I'm going to go back and do the front edge and the back edge of the same line. I don't try to do the line all at once. I, I tried that and I find that I end up with the lines not being um, straight. I end up getting diagonal lines if I do that. I've also done diagonals. Um, the diagonals are a little more trick or a little trickier. I'd like to try herring herringbone, but I haven't got brave enough to try it because that requires even more dexterity than what I've can muster here. 
I'm going to go around and just do the inside. Again, I'm trying to keep my hand in about the same spot and just trying to make a diagonal, a diagonal mark and just bringing the burner down. This burner has a skew tip in it. It's very sharp. So it's actually cutting or burning in, but it's cutting and burning at the same time. So I'm getting quite a deep line with this burner. Okay, that's that. And now we just gotta, now we can get the outside. I'm gonna I usually, um, I usually tip it, but I think I will try to not to do that. Just use the point. One thing about um, Poplar I've read and also discovered is that you, you don't, you can't really get fine, subtle shades with the Poplar with burning. It tends to be either um, black or white. It's all or nothing. You don't get nice, even shades like you can with maple, for example. So that's um, that. I guess I haven't done the backs of this. So um, that's it. We'll call it a day.